There's a book called Christology in the Making by James D.G. Dunn that articulates the truth about God's Word and wisdom far better than I could. Though I certainly don't agree with every conclusion Dunn reaches in his book, I really like it. It expounds what I knew and was finding prayerfully to be true from Scripture but was personally unable to put into words as exceptionally as a writer like Dunn, of course, could. What I'm going to do is quote some of the points he brings out in the hopes that it will make the scales fall from eyes that may be blinded, so inundated in their traditions and presuppositions that the truth may not currently even be an option, as emotionally attached as we all are to our traditional views of who God and Christ might be. All quotes are from pages 163 to 176 of his book, but first I'm going to go over some of the milk of the word um, before we dive into more figurative, metaphoric, or poetic texts while inventing doctrines a presupposition with no regard for ancient Hebrew thinking. And then I'll run through the texts themselves and Dunn's view from his thorough study and research. He's a very respected scholar. But first let's just go over some simple texts that we should adopt, you know, as the truthful statements they are. Jeremiah ten twelve says God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Right off the bat is wisdom a person here. If not, why shouldn't texts like these be used as our milk and understanding before diving into books where wisdom is personified and calling it a person? Shouldn't we perhaps instead just say God founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding while comprehending that even though God's attributes and functions are so incredible that they're personified vividly in Proverbs, they aren't really people. Psalm 104.24 says, How many are your works, O Yahuwah? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Jeremiah 51.15 says, He made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Now that's some of the easy milk we must keep in mind while understanding that functions of God and even people are often scripturally, vividly personified in scripture and poeticized. Okay, finally we'll read um, Proverbs 8. It says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of man. About these passages, Dunn says, and this skips around everywhere, so my recommendation is to read the book, of course. He gets into the historical context of the passages themselves, which is very interesting and important. He says, if we set out the passages in the most likely chronological order, it becomes evident that there is both a development in the talk about wisdom, and that the development is due in large part to influence, positive and negative, from religious cults and philosophies prevalent in the ancient Near East at the time. He goes on to say, attractive to many scholars, is the thesis that Proverbs 8, 22 through 31, and more clearly Sirach 24, has been greatly influenced by the cult of Isis from Egypt. The chief point of comparison is that Isis proclaims herself as the divine agent who created and sustains the universe, as the teacher who has revealed to men the principles of morality and the laws and arts of civilization. We know of at least one hymn in the first person to this effect, which circulated widely throughout the empire of the Ptolemies, probably as early as the 3rd century B.C. Skipping ahead, however deeply in Palestinian soil and Jewish faith was the last Israelite talk of wisdom, many of the images and words used to describe her were drawn from wider religious thought and worship. And this is the key here, to bring it all together. 
the aim being to present the worshipers of Yahweh with as attractive as possible an alternative to the cults and speculations more widely prevalent in their time. In order to understand what meaning such words and statements have for those who use them, we must interpret them in the context in which they were used. Skipping ahead again, he says no worship is offered to wisdom. Wisdom has no priests in Israel. That is to say, when set within the context of faith in Yahweh, there is no, no clearer indication that the wisdom language of these writings has gone beyond vivid personification. For the Jew of Alexandria, as well as the Jew of Palestine, the wisdom of God had been most fully and clearly expressed and embodied in the Torah. And we know Christ fulfilled that as the greater embodiment of wisdom, so that makes sense to me. It would appear then as though the Jewish wisdom writers do indeed take up some of the more widespread language of Near Eastern religious speculation and do so in conscious awareness of its use elsewhere. But they do not, I repeat, do not draw the same conclusions for worship and practice as the polytheistic religions do. On the contrary, they adapt this wider speculation to their own faith and make it serve to commend their own faith. To wisdom understood and worshipped as a divine being, one of Isis' many names, they pose the alternative of wisdom identified as the law given to Israel by the one God. The Jewish wisdom writers use wisdom alongside affirmations of Jewish monotheism without any sense that the latter is in any way threatened by the former. Dunn then goes on to give tons of examples where wisdom is used and personified, where it is clearly and irrefutably not a person, and one of those would be in Proverbs 3.19, where the Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. To me, this text is as clear as another one. Psalm 33.6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. Yet Christians think this wisdom and this word are a literal person alongside him in the Old Testament. Yahushua fulfilled God's word and wisdom to be sure, but is he really a person in these texts? Except in the sense God didn't create anything without knowing Christ would fulfill all things. Be honest with yourself. Dunn goes on to point out that Ben Sirah speaks of creation without any reference to wisdom in a number of passages, that he had no intention of giving wisdom the status of an independent entity. Dunn also points out that the author of the Wisdom of Solomon had not the slightest thought of it as an independent divine entity. He gives lots of text and support for this in his book. He goes on to say, Wisdom as a divine hypostasis involves an Im the importation of a concept whose appropriateness here is a consequence of the technical meaning it acquired in a much later Trinitarian controversies of the early church. It has not been demonstrated that Hebrew thought was already contemplating such distinctions within its talk of God. On the contrary, for a Jew to say that wisdom affects all things and that love of wisdom is the keeping of her laws was simply to say in a more picturesque way that God created all things wisely, that God's wise purpose is clearly evident in the exodus from Egypt and most fully expressed in the law he gave through Moses. He goes on to mention that wisdom is only one of a number of words in the Old Testament and intertestamental literature described as though they were divine entities independent of God. Just a few we have in Psalms, steadfast love and faithfulness meeting, righteousness and peace kissing, honor and majesty surrounding him, strength and beauty filling his sanctuary, a light and truth being sent out to guide me, let them lead me to your holy mountain, let your right hand teach you awesome deeds, dominion and fear are with God. So here we have things that aren't people with God. Um, it's poetic language. Remember his word, which symbolized his original plan for creation, was also with him and expressive of his being, just like wisdom, dominion, and fear can be spoken of as if they are with God, not as people, but as his outreach to mankind, spoken of as if they are um, alive sometimes. Uh, Isaiah 51.9 says, Awake, awake, clothe yourself with strength, O arm of the Lord. 
Awake as in days gone by, as in generations of old. Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? So in the Isaiah passage, we have the arm of the Lord, clothed with strength, waking up and piercing. But is this arm a person? Some would probably say so. But of course it's not, not unless a person comes to embody it poetically when he has a demonstration of Yahuwah's own strength through his person as most exceptionally demonstrated through Yahushua. Then that person could poetically be God's arm because Yah's strength worked through him. The same logic could be used for the off-personified wisdom. Um, so God's wisdom was in, embodied in... Oh, in many ways, and, and no person is a literal attribute, though they can represent and embody and fulfill that function or that attribute. Dunn goes on to say the judgment that in such passages were more in the realm of Hebraic personification than Near Eastern hypostatization is further confirmed when we recall that not only divine attributes but also more human characteristics can be personified in precisely the same way. So, for example, with injustice, wickedness, and sorrow, injustice dwells in your tents, wickedness shuts its mouth, sorrow and sighing flee away. So Dunn concludes, It seems that we have little ground for dissenting from the views of those most familiar with Jewish thought in its rabbinic expression. The Hellenistic Judaism of the LXX did not think of wisdom as a hypostasis or intermediary being any more then the Old Testament writers and the rabbis. Wisdom, like the name, the glory, the spirit of Yahweh, was a way of asserting God's nearness, his involvement with his world, his concern for his people. All these words provided expressions of God's eminence, his act of concern in creation, revelation, and redemption, while at the same time protecting his holy transcendence and holy otherness. It is very unlikely that pre-Christian Judaism ever understood wisdom as a divine being in any sense independent of Yahweh. The language may be the language of the wider speculation of the time, but within Jewish monotheism and Hebraic literary idiom, wisdom never really becomes more than a personification of a function of Yahweh, a way of speaking about God himself, of expressing God's active involvement with his world and his people without compromising his transcendence. That's all from done. Now I'll make just a few statements. God's word was fulfilled in Yahushua, the light of the world that God gave to mankind, foreordained before he ever made the world in his wisdom. God knowing that his wisdom would be revealed exceptionally, inimitably, and fully in his Lamb, the Redeemer that he created nothing without foreknowing as the fulfillment and sanctification of it all. Yahushua was the safety net decreed to rescue mankind after its fall. In this sense, all was created in him for its redemption and renewal. Yahushua encompassed and fulfilled Yahuwah's word and wise plans from the beginning. God did not create anything without his wisdom and word that became Yahushua when he was born as a man in the flesh, the Son of God, because God begat him by spirit through a virgin womb. That is why he's the Son of God. God's plan and redemption for mankind, yes, his word and wisdom, at last revealed so beautifully in the flesh. Again, this all becomes so easy to understand once we heed Hebrew thought forms and God's purpose for man from Genesis to Revelation, a kingdom represented on a new earth by sanctified, faithful mankind, made possible by the prototype, perfect, exalted beyond measure, Son of God a way to salvage what he knew Adam would lose in Christ, the last Adam. The most beautiful truth you could ever hear. Our hope is a resurrection at the last day to live forever with Yahushua as opposed to floating away to heaven at death. Yes, our hope has been misplaced by Hellenized Christianity. We will be a temple for Yahuwah to indwell forever as we inhabit and reign his footstool. As noted before, the references to Yahuwah's functions and attributes in the Bible and in intertestamental literature are both vast and often tell vivid personification. To isolate a couple wisdom ones and call it a person, I think would be a mistake. Think of texts like Proverbs 3.19 and roll with the simplicity in those. Though I've no doubt some of the New Testament creation passages 
in reference to God creating in Christ might have a poetic allusion to brought to Proverbs 8 I don't think it's because Yahushua was a person creating for God because Yahushua became what God created everything in his word from his lips and his function called wisdom which means Christ transcended humanity and even the angels because no one else can make such a claim that they're the fulfillment of all things decreed since before the world was ever made only Yahushua can make that claim as the bread the man who came down from heaven the flesh that would give life to the world with God from the beginning a plan for faithful mankind's immortality he brought forth before he made the world to save it but that plan was not a spirit creature who created for Yahuwah and came down from heaven literally because God created alone and Christ only gave God credit for creating and it is flesh that came down from heaven figuratively and that bread or that flesh was the word and wisdom of God life from God to mankind a pre-existent spirit creature was not I'll conclude with some wisdom of Solomon passages in chapter 9 it says O God of my fathers and Lord of mercy who hast made all things with thy word and ordained man through thy wisdom that he should have dominion over the creatures which thou hast made and order the world according to equity and righteousness and execute judgment with an upright heart give me wisdom that sitteth by thy throne and reject me not from among thy children for I thy servant and son of thine handmaid am a feeble person and of a short time and too young for the understanding of judgment and laws for though a man be never so perfect among the children of men yet if thy wisdom be not with him he shall be nothing regarded do these have allusions to Yahushua perhaps because he became God's ultimate representation and fulfillment of God's own wisdom Yahushua is represented and prefigured all over the Old Testament without being yet physically manifest yes it should be clear this is poetic language in these Wisdom of Solomon passages where wisdom is not a spirit creature obviously personification is called precisely that because it makes the function or attributes sound like it's a person even though it's not though a person may embody it in these instances and every other where poetry or personification is used wisdom is a real person should not be assumed that wouldn't be the soundest interpretation considering the parallel of other instances where functions are personified when you know it's not a person you can't arbitrarily isolate certain ones and say well it is here but it isn't here a couple last texts will examine to explain why Yahushua is the wisdom of God or that he embodies it and represents what it entails first Corinthians 2 6 says yet among the mature we do impart wisdom although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory and this reminds me of another text first Peter 1 20 that says that Yahushua was foreordained before the founding of the world but was manifest in the last times for our sake so we have Yahushua who was the decreed wisdom of God before the ages um, for our glory who became manifest in the last days for our salvation as an incarnation of God the Father's wisdom not of a pre-existent son yes God's wisdom that which would eventually come to fruition and in the flesh in the foreordained Messiah when the right time came for God's plans for faithful mankind to be fulfilled was that which he created all things in God knew the one who would encompass and demonstrate his own wisdom would also ensure a thriving of and the surviving of God honoring humanity in a glorified resurrection in the pattern of his sons in this wise plan we gain an indescribable inheritance that being a kingdom that will never pass away restored to Edenic conditions for faithful mankind first Corinthians 1 30 says and because of him you're in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God righteousness and sanctification and redemption so the wit so what's wrapped up in the wisdom of God would be righteousness sanctification and redemption of mankind all fulfilled in Yahushua so that's how he became wisdom for us 
Christ established righteousness in his own love and faith became our sanctification and redemption, which was the perfect display of God's decreed wisdom for a new creation, all in Christ. Praise God. These texts prove that Christ was not named wisdom as a preexistent spirit being, but rather became an incarnation of God's own wisdom in the flesh when God was in him fully by spirit, reconciling a world unto himself when the full limit of time had arrived for such as that to occur.